Sorry, you just have to hit play. Just restart it. Is it started now? Is the time going? Is the time going? Here, I'll do it. I'll let it go one more time. My name is Ryan, and tonight with the help of Lindsay, Casey, and Allison, we're going to tell you all a little bit about interviewing. Now, it's not going to be a step-by-step -step how to guide on how to do it, but hopefully by the time we're through, you'll all feel a little bit more comfortable in conducting an interview. So I'm going to kick it off by talking about some interviewing techniques. And the first one I will talk about is the, it might not be going. Let's take it from the top. All right, let's do it. Okay. Hello, my name is Ryan. <laughs> uh, nice to see you all again tonight with the help of Lindsay, Allison, and Casey. We're going to tell you a little bit about interviewing. And like I said, not going to be a how to step by step guy. But by the time we're through, you should feel a little more comfortable in conducting an interview. I'm going to kick us off by talking about some interviewing techniques. And the first one we'll talk about is the non-directive. Now, the non-directive is an unorthodox technique where you're trying to set it up like it's a conversation, not really a, an uptight interview. So you drop the stuffy act, you let it be free-flowing, flexible, like these office yogis, and uh, just try to get the conversation going. Um, obviously, you're not going in here without a plan. You, you do have a list of topics in mind that you want to hit. Um, but... Like I said, you can dive into their answers as much as you want, just like a normal conversation with your friend. One of the advantages of this type of interview is that you get to really see a side of their personality that you don't see in a structured interview. Um, obviously, the reason for this is that the pretense is dropped. You're trying to make it seem like you're having coffee with a long time term. So you can figure out afterwards if you think their personality is going to fit in with the corporate culture that you guys have. Which leads me into the next, the opposite, the structured interview. We've all been to these. It's uh, it's the basic one. Companies, I mean, hiring managers come up with a list of questions that they're going to go through for each and every candidate. And there's a reason why it's used by every, everybody. It's the most efficient, it's the easiest, and the easiest to prepare for on our end as well, and as the applicant. So when you're an applicant, you should really expect to see uh, when you're an interviewer, you should expect to see that the applicants have most of their answers rehearsed and prepared. Uh, because, like I said, the questions are standardized. As an interviewer, you want to ask the same questions every single time because that way it's easier to compare one applicant's answers to another's. You can probably learn more, in this technique specifically, more about an uh, applicant's strengths and their skill set than you can in a non-directive because you're able to tailor the questions based on what you think you want in a candidate, in a future job holder. Which leads me into situational interviewing. Um, this is a little different, a little more in depth. It's going to take you longer to prepare for because we're asking hypothetical questions to our candidates here. We're not saying, why are you leaving your last job? Uh, what did you do in this scenario? We're saying, what would you do if you were in this circumstance? What we get from this opportunity is an insight, a window into their problem-solving strategies. Um, and that's not too easy to get with the structured interview. So we want to try to keep track of things about how they solve problems, the scope of their knowledge and their expertise about the topic, and how they apply this to the problem-solving process. Now, this will hopefully, like I said, get them to think on their feet, um, something you won't see with a... Well, you might see it with a non directive, but you probably won't see it with a structured interview. And it will give their an answers authenticity because you're seeing a real one to one view inside their head. Now, in a behavioral interview, it's a little bit different. You're not asking, What would you do if? You're asking, In this scenario in the past, what did you do? When this happened, what did you do? And we, we like these types of interviews because for most of us, we believe past behavior. 
past actions is a good indicator of future performance. So in a behavioral interview, we follow the STAR method. It's what was the situation, what was the task, what were the actions you took, and what were the results? We take notes of each of these things that they answer. When we ask them, tell me about the time in blank. And we use that to build a profile of that. Now, obviously, make sure you ask the right questions. You don't want to say, tell me about a time when you came in late to work. Maybe you do. I don't know. Maybe that's your preference. But you want to ask questions where you can delve deeper and find out about the context of the circumstance, the context and the circumstances surrounding your actions. Now, with targeted selection, it's it's kind of like behavioral interviewing, but with a more targeted focus on actual metrics. So we build uh, a list of competencies that we desire in the candidates that, that we're interviewing. And um, we create a sort of rubric like we've all used before. And that way, we can level the playing field for everybody and efficiently evaluate and compare applicants' answers to questions uh, effectively. And this is nice because it takes some of the personal bias out of it. Um, yeah. So actual metrics and numbers are so much easier to compare than just saying, whose answer did I like better? I can, I can say, wow, this person scored a 75. That's pretty clearly higher than a 67. Um, which leads me into my last topic of the night is evaluation. It's just something that you implement in all types of interviewing. Um, you want to take some of the subjective personal bias out. So with evaluation, you use that in all types of interviewing processes, whether it's hiring for a new position or for an internal promotion. Um, actually, a personal story of mine, I worked for a company, not naming any names, for about two years. And they had a job posting for two uh, internal promotions at the same time. I didn't go in case you didn't go for it in case you guys were wondering, but um, I know obviously every single person who did. I've been working there for two years, so I had an intimate relationship. With them. So my manager conducted the five interviews, and then the next day I worked with my manager. We had a nice little conversation, and she asked me, "Ryan, who should I hire?" And I said, "Hire these two people." I didn't think she was being serious. It did turn out though that she hired those two people. So. Did she objectively evaluate those people and not let her personal bias interfere? Probably, and I was probably just lucky. But um, just a little hint, don't let your schmucks like me, your, your grunt workers, influence your decision. Now, on to uh, Lindsay, who's going to take it away with selection. <laughs> All right, thank you, Ryan. My name is Lindsay. I'm going to be talking about selection. This is different from recruiting and hiring. This is the process of finding the most qualified candidate for your vacant positions. I will first explain what personnel selection is, as well as its benefits, then the steps to conduct a proper personnel selection process. Personnel selection is the process through which organizations make decisions about who they will and will not hire from a pool of qualified job applicants with the quali qualifications, knowledge, and skills to fill the vacant position. The goal of the process is to choose the most suitable candidate whose contributions are going to be the most valuable to the organization. There are several reasons good personal selection is important to an organization. First, the most obvious is having the most qualified candidates. This process is going to help organizations to do just that. The second benefit of personnel personal selection is to reduce um, training costs. The thought is that if you're hiring qualified candidates, that they will be able to grasp the work much easier and not have a high, high training cost. Um, according to one study, an organization can spend up to $1,200 in training costs, so reducing the need for that reduces that expense. The last benefit of proper personal selection I'm going to touch on is about the actual personnel problems that can happen inside an organization. The thought is that if you hire a qualified candidate, they will be more satisfied and happy within their position, thus leading to less problems. Um, this is me at Bonesaw. I work down the street in Glassboro. Come say hi. Um, a personal story I'm sure a lot of us can relate to in many different jobs is having an unqualified coworker 
because this can take away, it wastes time and effort that you have when you're on, then they're not minimally qualified for the position. Like, for example, in my job, if I had a unminimally qualified coworker, they're not gonna know the basics behind a bar, like pouring beer, using point of sale, things like that, they're gonna take away from the productivity of the team, me, and the organization. So good strategy, good personal selection will stop that. Um, good personal selection strategy will satisfy five measurements that are reliable, valid, able to generalize the information to different candidates, um, offer high utility, and be legal, all to help make a decision on who to hire. The reliability measurement indicates how free that measurement is from random error. This helps guarantee consistent results. The validity measurement describes the extent to which performance on that measure is related to what it is designed to assess, like job performance. Um, the generalizing measurement shows whether the selection method is valid in context to which the organization wants to use it. An example would be like cognitive ability, because that's generally used across different jobs. Uh, utility of the selection method measures essentially the practical value of the information, whether that method makes more sense, costs less than it is to use. The decision made through personal selection must also be legal. This means following laws and guideline, guidelines to discourage discrimination and access for disabled employees. It means following the laws within Civil Rights Act, ADA, and Equal Opportunity Employment. Now that we know what personnel selection is and why we should use it properly, the next thing I'm going to talk about is the actual process of personnel selection, which is through recruiting, test, interview, compare, check, and select your candidate. First, to recruit. In this step, you are looking through resumes and applications to find, to create a pool of candidates that are at least minimally qualified to fill the position. Personal selection begins from here and hopes that you'll have a reduced amount of candidates to screen. Second, second step is the test. Several types of tests can be administered prior to interviewing. We will get more into the types of tests later in the presentation where they include knowledge and aptitude tests. Um, this is where the, oh. Work samples are another popular technique where they do tasks that are similar to what the job is going to require. The third step is the third step in the person personnel selection is to interview. You'll first um, conduct phone interviews with your potential candidates to weed out those who may not actually be interested or minimally qualified. And from that step, from the surviving candidates, you'll move on to in-person interviews, where you will ask questions that are job-related or cultural fit questions. Um, well, well, Ryan actually just went into the types of questions you would ask in these situations. The fourth step is to compare. The comparing step not only compares candidate to candidate, but it compares the candidate skills to the job requirements. Um, popular ways to interpret this information is to create a selection matrix. This is where um, you'll assign numeric values to the different job requirements and qualifications and then rate your candidates accordingly. Next, you're on to the check step, which is where you will conduct checks like background checks, uh, driving records, things of that nature, but you must be cautious to not perform any tests that you can't legally do until you have a formal offer. You will also check uh, references to validate any information as well. Formally selecting your candidate is the last step in your personal selection process, personnel selection process. This decision is generally combined with both the candidate's abilities as well as their motivation to fill the position. This step is where you'll create a formal offer. Um, in conclusion, um, a good personnel selection is vital to an organization that helps give you the best candidate as well as check your efficiency of your hiring process. Um, I will give it off to Casey now to explain job placements. Hello, I am Casey. I'm a senior HR management major, and I'm going to talk to you guys about job postings. So we're going to backtrack a little bit. Um, we talked about interviewing techniques and selection. 
So now we're going to go into talking about um, how to post jobs, uh, the legal aspects, and different like descriptions and wording used that's like extremely important. So everyone knows um, job boards like LinkedIn, Glassdoor, Career Builder, Monster, Indeed. These are all super popular job boards. Um, a lot of them are subscription services, but we'll talk about that in a few slides. So um, these are the websites that are made on purpose to help candidates find jobs as well as uh, recruiters find employees. Uh, the top four job posting websites are ZipRecruiter, Glassdoor, Career Builder, and Indeed. Uh, these are the most popular and used the most widely among employers and employees. So now we're going to talk about how to um, how to use a job board. They're very simple. Typically, the company creates an account with the website, and then um, you're typically allowed a certain amount of job postings, um, depending on what you choose. And from this. Um, you post all the job description, everything, and upload it. A, a lot of other companies, for example, my first internship I ever had in HR was at Southern Jersey Family Medical Centers, and there I worked a lot with their um, ATS on demand system. And through there, they linked all of their job boards, such as we used uh, Monster, Glassdoor, and Indeed. And so when we created a new job in the system, it automatically posted to these websites, which is very convenient. So a lot of job boards have the convenience of being able to link it with your company's website rather than having to go in and individually post on each thing because you want as much exposure as possible. Um, so the one downside to that was that through these job boards, when you are posting them, you have to pay for a majority of them. Um, most job boards are subscription-based or pay for post. So when you pay for post, it's you say, hey, I want 10 job postings this week. and they'll give you a set price, or you can subscription where you get a, a range of job postings you can post every month. Um, additionally, there are some free job posting boards. Um, you can try a free trial through Glassdoor and a free trial through Monster before they end up eventually making you pay if you want to continue using their site. Additionally, you can pay to promote your job on these websites. So a lot of companies will pay, say, the $20 to have their job move up on the list of jobs that are listed. So a uh, really important thing when you're making your job posting is to make sure you have all your requirements clearly uh, listed out. This is a good way to defer unqualified candidates. By listing exactly what you want from a candidate, if people read it and they see that they don't have this expected requirement, then they can know that they shouldn't even apply to the job. Um, the main thing that employers use to weed out candidates is education requirements. A lot of times you'll see a job posting, you'll say, you must have a bachelor's degree, you must have a master's degree, and through these job postings, people that don't fit that description can eventually not, not apply. Um, additionally, in the job description, you give a detailed account of what is going to be entitled in the job, so what your daily duties will be, what um, your hours are, like what's expected from you, what the company is about, stuff like that, and through the job description, um, and like if potential candidates can see if they want to apply or not. Uh, what's really important in the job description is make sure you add all the little details, regardless of whether candidates will read them or not. Details are really important on a legal basis, um, and using certain words, word choices, extremely important when making job postings, because you don't want to come off as discriminatory or, um, using words that can potentially have you be sued. Um, so a lot of what I did at my job a couple summers ago was I would go through our job descriptions and make sure that the words were universal rather than uh, particularly pointing out people so that we couldn't be called discriminatory in our job posting. So discrimination is a really big thing nowadays, especially in New Jersey. New Jersey is one of the most liberal states when it comes to um, employee rights. So a big thing is um, companies want to make sure that they're always like doing their best practice. You don't want to have any loopholes in people being able to find a reason you were discriminating against them in the job. Um, a really big movement that's been going around the last couple of years is Van the Box. This is for people who have uh, records from arrests and stuff. And a lot of times on job applications, it will say, um, have, do you have a record of a felony or a misdemeanor? And you have to check yes or no. Uh, this is now, now no longer widely accepted across the country, 
And then another important thing that uh, companies need to make sure they put in their job descriptions is their equal opportunity employment statements. Um, EEO statements are really important because they serve um, to show that the candidate, you're upfront saying that we are about diversity, we are equally opportunistic for everyone, and if you want to apply, we're not going to not hire you because of your background. Um, so they ensure the company can confidently say that they're practicing equal employment. It decreases the chances of facing a discrimination lawsuit, and the organization that ensures EEO um, can increase their diversity in the workplace. So finally, in job postings, one of the most important requirements is a resume and a cover letter. Um, a lot of times, it'll, you'll have a little link that you can upload your resume or cover letter through from your computer instead of having to manually input it. This is convenient for both the candidate and the hiring um, team because it puts every information that is relevant towards you being qualified into one spot. And then again, preventing unqualified applicants, um, the resume is a good way to do that because you can take five to seven seconds to look at a resume and see if they're automatically qualified or not. Uh, depending on their education and their skill set and their um, past. So now I'm going to pass it along to Allison and she's going to talk about the legal aspects of interviewing and what you can and can't do. So hi, I'm Allison. Tonight I'm going to be going over the legal aspects of giving an interview, so just some rules and regulations. Also, most of the stuff's already been touched on, so I'm just like kind of overviewing everything, going over questions that can be asked and can't be asked during an interview, just making sure you're asking the right questions like legally for when you are conducting the interviews. So some questions that you can ask as the candidate is what I'm going to go over first. So some good questions that you can ask are, um, how did you like? How did you think you excelled at the company? Like being like a manager, if you're talking to a hiring manager, what's the company culture like? Things of that nature. Like why did you particularly go for this job? Is like some questions you can ask as a candidate, but you also like as the interviewer, you want to ask them. Like Brian talked about earlier, like what, like why do you think you're qualified for this job? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Focusing on not asking yes or no questions, because that's not really giving them a chance to explain why they'd be a good fit for that potential job. And um, some questions you definitely don't want to ask. You want to avoid asking anything about age. Don't ask their birthday, when they graduated, like how old they are, anything like that. I'm sure a lot of you going through the interviewing process now have been asked, um, like, when are you graduating? But technically, you're not allowed to ask that because it gives away, like, your age. They can work back in time to see when you graduate from high school stuff like that and you also it's bad practice to ask anything about your family like life if you have kids if you don't have kids don't ask oh like are you married are you getting married do you want to have kids in the future what do you think about like child care how would you work around your job with that you just want to focus on questions that actually relate to the job you don't want to ask any personal questions during an interview and now i'm going to be talking about some human resources law that you need to know before you can be able to conduct an interview such as civil rights laws disability laws discriminations to make sure you are acting all in the legal practice for when you are conducting an interview as like an hr manager eventually when we all get to those roles so first is civil rights just to make sure everyone is treated equally and fair when being interviewed everyone should have the same opportunity for the potential job as the next candidate so an easy way to keep it all equal is to just ask everyone the same questions. And obviously when you ask yes or no questions, it leads into a discussion, but just try to make sure you're staying on the same baseline for everyone. So the same goes for discrimination. You don't wanna ask any questions based on race, sex, or like national origin. Any questions like that gives away, like if you think you're being discriminated against, the person who's interviewing for that job can come back at the employer and say like, I didn't get this position because of whatever. The same goes with disability. I'm just gonna give an example. If someone's like in a wheelchair, you can't not hire them because you're like, oh, it's gonna take them longer to get to like the copier and back to work, like work that it's gonna take time out of their work. You can't not hire someone for that. You still have to give them a fair chance to interview and just keep all the questions equal and same for, any, for everybody. So now just, some ways to avoid discrimination, which is what happens in a workplace a lot, like retaliation, race, disability, sex, all the things that I just discussed are being highly like discriminated against in the workplace. So just when you're an HR manager in the HR field, just make sure you're avoiding all of these things and ways that you can discriminate 
against people and just keep everything equal and fair giving interviews. And just the same thing, when you're looking at all your candidates, make sure you give everyone the same opportunity as the next person. Don't give the first person like, oh, they were the first one to get out of the way. So like, I want to give them the job over the last person. You should be treating everybody the same exact way. Even if it's like 15 people interviewing for the job, you never know who's going to be the best candidate at the end. I'm just going to tell a personal story at when I worked at the protocol group last summer. And I hope like this doesn't happen to like anyone in the professional field, but I recruited and be my manager a resume of someone of like the Muslim ethnicity. And she came back like after the interview, she said the person did a great job, like bilingual reached all the requirements of the job. But then she came back in and said that they weren't gonna give him the job because um, Muslim people's like food smells bad and she didn't want that scent like taking over the office. Obviously that's illegal. Obviously like you can't say that and you can't not give somebody a job for that, especially when he reached all the requirements. So just an example of definitely something not to do when you're like working in the HR field. And so just some best practices for when you're the candidate going for the job, which is probably what we're going through like now or just finished going through. Just come prepared, just for success. Be on time for the interview. If you're if you're late for an interview, no one's gonna wanna hire you for the job. They're gonna think you come late to the job. And always thank the interviewer after you finish. Just like give them a handshake like we always practice here. And when you're the one conducting the interviews, Make sure you read over the candidate's resume before they start because it, it just shows that you're interested in the candidate as they're interested in the job. You want to keep everything on like the same playing field. You should be just as interested in the candidate as they are in the job. You want to build a better team going forward. And just some unethical hiring practices that you want to avoid is hiring someone based on looks. I've heard of like people hiring like receptionists that are only girls just like based on looks and getting people like in and out of the door that's not legal you want to make sure you're hiring someone who's the best fit for the job not the best appearance like who fits the job the best you want to make sure they have the qualifications that you are looking for to build your team and just some more unethical hiring practices is not interviewing all the candidates like i kind of talked about earlier you want to make sure you're giving everyone the same chance and going through each resume making sure they're reaching the qualifications before you interview them and once you're giving someone the opportunity to interview, make sure you're giving everyone the same chance. And lastly, when you're being interviewed, you just want to follow up with a thank you um, email. It used to be a thank you letter, but it kind of like changes, like times change. So if you send an email within 24 hours that looks good to like the hiring manager, it shows that you're interested in the job. Even if that job like, wasn't the best fit for you, it's still giving you great practice like towards interviewing in the future for a job that you're really interested in. So that was the overview on the legal aspects of conducting an interview and going through the interviewing process. This is just like the basic like legal things you wanna make sure you're doing like in preparation when you become the hiring manager, when you're going through the interviewing process, just so that everyone's on the same page with the jobs. And so that's like the overview on interviewing as a whole. And Ryan touched on the interviewing techniques, Lindsay touched on selection, Casey touched on the job postings, I touched on the legal aspects. Like Ryan started with, that was only just like a little overview on interviewing, not like the whole process. Okay, we are going to take like a five minute break. Yeah, cool.